On March 22, 1975, the Browns Ferry nuclear power plant in Athens, Alabama caught fire. Although the fire was a dramatic spectacle, the damage was minimal and no one was injured. Nevertheless, the fire caused considerable public outcry against nuclear power and prompted significant new government regulation of nuclear power generation. The 1970s was a time of increased reliance on nuclear technology to produce civilian electricity. It was also a time characterized by increased fear of nuclear power. The Browns Ferry nuclear power plant fire increased the nuclear anxiety of the time, prompted Congress to pass new laws regulating the use of nuclear energy, and prompted the newly created Nuclear Regulatory Commission NRC, to issue radical new safety regulations. The fire also sparked a dialogue in the media and among American citizens about the potential dangers of commercial nuclear power plants. Since the fire, several news outlets have focused on what might have happened at Browns Ferry rather than on the actual events of the March 22 fire. In addition, popular media such as comic books and movies made in the late 1970s emphasized the potential consequences of nuclear disasters. Although the Browns Ferry fire resulted in nominal damage, the media and government called the fire a disaster because of the fear the accident caused in American society. The 1975 Browns Ferry Fire was a turning point in public opinion. The disaster that never happened caused increased fear of nuclear power plants and turned the public against the use of nuclear power to generate electricity. Background to the Browns Ferry Nuclear Power Plant On May 18, 1933, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt established the Federal Power Corporation in the United States. TVA's purpose, as stated in its charter, was to support the economy of the poor Tennessee Valley by improving navigation and preventing flooding of the Tennessee River and its tributaries. For this purpose, TVA built dams along the Tennessee River. In addition to improving navigation and preventing flooding, these dams produced electricity. By 1935, power generation and transmission had become TVA's main business. The agency supplied low-cost electricity to Tennessee Valley residents in areas that had never had access to electricity before. Although TVA tried to negotiate with private utilities, the agency ran into trouble when Alabama power shareholders filed a lawsuit challenging the legality of a public enterprise competing with private enterprises. The Browns Ferry Nuclear Power Plant, named for a ferry that operated at the site until the mid-1900s, was TVA's first nuclear power plant. Construction of the plant began in 1966. The Unit 1 reactor began commercial operation on August 1, 1974, and the Unit 2 reactor began commercial operation shortly thereafter, on March 1, 1975. When Browns Ferry began its commercial operation, most Americans supported the use of nuclear power to generate electricity. This widespread support for nuclear power plants was due in large part to a desire on the part of the public and the government to stop relying on foreign oil. In 1973, the United States and other Western countries experienced an oil crisis as a result of the Middle East oil embargo. On October 6, 1973, the Organization of the Petroleum Exporting Countries imposed an embargo on its oil supplies to the United States and other countries that had supported Israel during the Arab-Israeli War. During the embargo, the price of oil nearly quadrupled, reaching nearly $12 a barrel. The unreliability of foreign oil supplies created an incentive in the United States to create our own energy. Nuclear power plants provided a means to that end, and so public opinion was supportive. Fire The fire at the Browns Ferry Atomic Power Plant in Athens, Alabama, occurred on March 22, 1975, as a result of employees performing routine maintenance in the cabling room. Workers were pulling wires from the reactor building, located on one side of the cable room, to the control room located directly above the cable room. To connect the wires from the reactor building to the control room, the workers had to cut a hole in the firewalls separating the cable room from the reactor building and the control room. After the workers successfully connected the wires between the two rooms, they again sealed the hole in the wall with polyurethane foam, a type of foam gasket often used to insulate houses. Two workers then used candles to check the sealed section of the wall to see if air was leaking into the reactor building. The workers watched the candles to see if the flame would flicker, a sign that air was passing through the polyurethane barrier. 
The temporary containment material proved to be highly flammable and caught fire. Workers made efforts to extinguish the fire at its source, but they did not appear to realize that the fire was spreading along the wall of the reactor building due to drafts through the passage. The extent of the fire in the cable laying room was limited to a few feet from the passage, however, the presence of fire on the other side of the wall from the point of ignition was not detected until there was significant damage to the cables associated with the control of units 1 and 2. While workers were inspecting the newly sealed hole, the candle flame hit a crack in the polyurethane, igniting the material and in turn igniting the flammable plastic insulated control cables. There were no fire extinguishers in the cable laying room, and after unsuccessful attempts to extinguish the fire themselves, workers called the emergency services. The emergency workers also had difficulty extinguishing the fire, prompting the crew to activate a full flooding system. However, the flooding system failed. The fire was getting worse and the risk of a nuclear explosion was increasing. Working with extreme urgency, the emergency services then attempted to fight the fire with the carbon dioxide system. This tactic proved successful. The carbon dioxide fire suppression system prevented a large-scale disaster. Although the fire was contained, it continued to pose a threat. Before the fire in the cable routing room could be extinguished, the fire spread to the reactor building, causing additional problems for firefighters and plant operators. At 2 p.m., firefighters stopped trying to put out the fire in the control room, and plant operators decided to shut down units 1 and 2. However, when the plant operators attempted to shut down the reactor of Unit 2, they discovered that the emergency cooling system was not working, which was another setback. Eventually, the plant operators stopped both reactors and looked for another way to put out the fire in the reactor and control room buildings. Throughout the day, the fire chief informed the station chief that the fire was electrical, not chemical. The fire chief recommended using water to extinguish the fire, but the station chief and his supervisors were not initially receptive to the idea. According to TVA procedures, water would only be used in the event of a fire if all other attempts were unsuccessful. It was not until 6 p.m., almost six hours after the fire started, that the plant manager allowed firefighters to use water to extinguish the fire in the reactor building. Within 15 minutes the fire was virtually extinguished. Although the fire at the Browns Ferry Atomic Power Plant resulted in little damage, the public reaction to the accident was dramatic. Numerous publications, commentaries, and editorial cartoons mentioned the various potential dangers associated with nuclear power. Subscribe to the channel and share this video with your friends. Give it a thumbs up. Tell us interesting facts you know about the topic of this video. See you in new videos.